For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And now, the host of Light on the Rock, Philip Shields. Well, hello again, everybody. Last time when I gave part one on God's saving favor, God's saving grace, um, I, had, I had someone who did comment to me, and basically his comment was simply a scripture. I think it's Romans uh, 2, let me see, what is it now? Romans 2, verse 13, where he said that, for it's not the hearers of the law who will be justified, but the doers of the law will be justified. I believe to counter the emphasis that I had last week in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, that we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast, but by grace. All right, so, um, and no comment given, just the scripture, for you're justified, the, the ones who are doers of the law are the ones justified. That's true. If you could be a perfect doer, that's true if you never sinned. In the past, you would be seen as righteous. Or if you never sinned going forward, you would be seen as righteous. So what he wrote was absolutely true. But had he kept on reading, remember there were no chapter breaks. When Paul was writing about that, he was saying how, you know, you've got to be a doer of the law in Romans 2. And then in Romans 3, he says, basically the, the, the topic of Romans 3 is, but show me someone who has perfectly kept the law. Show me anyone, except Christ, of course. So that's the point of Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 20, there, actually Romans 3, I think it's verse 10, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there, Paul says, but there's no one who could be found who was righteous. Romans 3, verse 20 says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, the works, okay, the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Because basically he's just said all through that, the first 19 verses in Romans 3, no one's been able to do it. That's the reason for needing grace, God's favor, God's ability to accept us and to wipe out our sins and to favor and give us strength and energy and acceptance. That's why we need grace. So anyway, because all have sinned and all of us keep sinning, though to a much lesser degree, even after we have God's Holy Spirit, as Paul explains in Romans 7, the last half of it. So, I just want to introduce with that. Now, the sermon, this sermon part two, is, is about trying to come to that point where we can really have joy and peace with God's Spirit working in us, even though we do, in fact, still stumble. I also want to say right off the top, this topic is not just for Jews, it's not just for Christians or professing Christians. It's not just for the Western world. This topic of God's amazing grace is for all the world. You Hindus out there, I know many of you in Pakistan and other, other uh, Islamic countries and some Buddhist and Hindu countries, some of you in India, some of you in Thailand and so forth, come to this website from time to time, a lot of you from Russia. And so I want to say the Bible is very clear. God sent his son into all the world to save the world. It's meant for you Hindus, meant for you Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, Jewish believers, atheists, everybody, just everybody. God sent his, one, his son into the world to be savior of the world. It says in 1 John 4, 14, savior of the world. So I see people everywhere, and no matter uh, what their conduct uh, or their religion, I see them as my future brothers. Uh, they're brothers once they receive the Holy Spirit, and God's intention is to save just about everybody when it's all said and done. But, so they're my brothers and sisters. They just don't know it yet. <clears throat> so when we understand God's purpose, so when we understand God's purpose and God's grace, Surely we can begin to live out the new creation life that he's given us in joy and peace. And it's for everyone, everyone who responds. 
once we have God's holy, God's joy, I mean, inside of us, we're starting to learn what grace really is all about. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. We know the first part of the verse very well. I'm going to read it from the NIV. My dear children, I, read the, I write this to you so you will not sin. But he knows we all do still. Even though in 1 John 3, he talks about how those who are born again don't sin. Okay, Right here, he admits that, but I, I, I'm hoping you don't sin. And in chapter 1, a few verses earlier, he said, if you claim not to have any sins, you're lying. So here he says, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, here we go, but also for the sins of the whole world. So if you're somewhere over there in Islamabad or uh, Tajikistan or UAE, Jordan, or if you're in the South American countries or Central American countries or African countries, Asian countries, welcome to this site. Welcome to God's grace. He welcomes all of you for his divine favor. In spite of whether you be Muslim, Buddhist, or whatever, he wants you on his path. If he's calling you, if he's calling you, and if you're feeling that calling, that urging, that goading from God, call out to him. I don't care if you're Buddhist or Muslim. Call out to the, just say, living God, holy God that Philip preaches. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Father of Jesus Christ. I'm calling out to you, and I'd like you to know I'd love your grace, your favor on my life. I'm, in, I'm very confident of this incredible, gracious word and favor of our God. I'm very confident that I'll be in his kingdom. I'm very confident that I have eternal life. I'm very confident that I have passed from death to life. We're going to read those again today. So I hope you will... Um, Listen to what I'm saying. I hope to see you in that kingdom. So this topic will be hard to exhaust or fully use up. Please be sure to hear part one first. And welcome, everybody. I am Philip Shields. I'm the host of this site and uh, founder of it. The whole goal is for us to have a closer walk with God, to build that relationship of loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul and might and being and mind, everything, and to love each other. The two great commandments are to love God with everything you've got and to love each other. So uh, remember to uh, check out our website carefully. We have video sermons. We have audio sermons. I'll be adding fresh audio sermons. We probably have two to 250, maybe more total sermons in there and hundreds of blogs, short, short articles that I think you'll, you'll get a lot, a lot out of. Just look at the bottom of the homepage. It says click here to uh, view the entire list. And then start just scrolling too. See, you'll, you'll find lots of topics that you'll enjoy. Let others know about us too, please, if you, if you would. And if you wish to help support what we're doing, we certainly would be so grateful and thankful. We have about five people right now who regularly help uh, with something, some amount, uh, most months. And that goes, a lot of it goes to help helping the indigenous, uh, indigenous people of, uh, of Kenya and other places that have orphans and churches and uh, need food money, education, that goes towards even the equipment uh, to the site, uh, getting it up to speed to where it should be. So anyway, so what's, I want to ask you this question, what's the end game? What's the reason that God has his gracious favor going on? What's he trying to accomplish for it? What's the point of it? It boils down to this. God in the highest wants a family. That's it. God in the highest wants to be father of his literal children. And we'll talk more about that sometime. I, I do have uh, two or three sermons on, on that. Uh, God's incredible, what's the word I use in there? But anyway, his, uh, his desire to have a family, I'll, I'll give it to you in a minute here. But God wants us uh, to have a loving family relationship. He, he wants children. And, and now he already has us as begetting, being begotten in, in, into him. Uh, in 1 John 3, verse 1 to 3, it says, it says, um, now are we children of God. Now are we. Romans 8, verses 14 to 17 says, we are all already children of God. 
the Word, when He became flesh and blood, human as Jesus Christ, Yeshua, as I say, Jesus, most people say, was the firstborn of God's many brethren. Many brethren, as it says in Romans 8, 29. He's the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. So we other children of God are brothers to Yeshua. God the Father is our Father. Yeshua, Jesus, is the oldest brother. And we have uh, many more coming along. So and I like the fact that it says in Hebrews 2, verse 10, that he's not ashamed to call me his uh, brothers, his brother or sister, to call you brother or sister. John 1, verses 10 to 13, let's read that. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yeah, the one God the Father created all things, we hear in Ephesians 3, 9. He created all things through Christ, okay, who created all things. So God the Father and Jesus worked together to get to that point. And um, uh, it says here, he was in the world and the world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. That's to the Jewish people. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. To those who believe in his name. We're going to be spirit being children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Of God. Let that sink in. That's the whole point of grace. That's the reason for having it. So you were called by God. You were led by his goodness, according to Romans 2.4, to repentance. God was working to you, with you long before you actually said the words that you repented, that you accepted Yeshua as your Savior, and you wanted God to forgive you your sins and to give you the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was working with you long before that. Uh, Paul, remember when he was called Saul at first, and uh, Yeshua, Jesus, appeared to him as a bright light and just said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What have I done to you? And why are you kicking? Why are you resisting against my goads, the pricks, you know, in the King James? I've been goading you. Why have you been pushing back? So I think you'll find that God even uh, was probably working with you a lot earlier than you might think while you're still from early childhood, maybe even before you were born. He was goading you and maybe working with grandparents, great-grandparents to produce you. In God's gracious favor, he gives us his Holy Spirit and that begets us into his family. And uh, now we're begotten of the Holy Spirit, John 3, verse 5 to 8. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. You see, you don't see the wind, but you hear it. You kind of know it's coming from here or there, but you don't know where it's going. And, and so is the spirit. He says, that which is born of spirit is spirit, John 3, verses 5 to 8. And we're also told that once we receive God's Holy Spirit, we belong to God. We become the temple of God. He comes and lives inside of us. And in John 17, verses 9 and 10, Yeshua said, all of yours are now mine and mine are yours. Okay, so we now belong to Yeshua. We're part, in fact, of his body. This was the whole reason for having grace in the first place. So that's why Romans 8.29 says that he was the firstborn among many brethren. You'll see it up here on the screen. Let that sink in. You've been born of God. You're the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. And part of that calling uh, is that you and I, when we say we believe in him, we're actually saying that you're, my, you're our master, you're our Lord. I, we, we submit to you. We, we want you to lead us. We want to follow you. We want to obey you. We want to obey you. And the Father's given all things to his firstborn son, all things. And, uh, and so uh, it goes on to say in Romans 8, verses 14 to 17, that, he, that we become co-heirs with Christ. He will share all of that with us. John 1, 14, the Word became flesh. The Word was God. Remember, the Word was with God. John 1, first three verses. This Word, who was God, became flesh. John 1, 14, and dwelt among us. We beheld this glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full, full of Haris, or Harris, I mean to say, full of Harris. Uh, it looks like cheris in the Greek, full of grace and truth. 
The Son of God came to pay a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. Now remember from the last time that grace in the New Testament doesn't mean just unmerited pardon. It means favor, acceptance, God's blessings, God's joy with you. This is why um, he, he wants us all to accept that and to be part of that eventually. And this is why when Yeshua came, he was a friend of sinners. A good example for us. Do you just diss your neighbors because they keep Christmas trees out there and all that? No, I hope not. Uh, I hope you can be a friend of your neighbors who may not attend your church or your fellowship or keep the Sabbath. Be a friend of sinners because God is going to work with them. He might even, might even use you to help call them into his family. If you're willing to open your mind to that and be a friend of sinners, please, please be a friend of sinners. That's what you're called to be doing. For some reason, I got an alarm going off here. Okay. To all of you who believe in the life and resurrection of Yeshua, God gives all those people the right to be born of God. Don't be looking down on anyone. Anyone. Muslims, Buddhists, whatever. Shintoists. Don't look down on anybody. Someday he's going to have them in God's family. You watch. So the point of all that is to work with humanity till he can have a family of children of God who are holy children of God. So God had to have the Holy Spirit, the set-apart children, two set-apart children who have been chosen uh, and who themselves have chosen God's way, God's teachings, and they've resisted and rejected the serpent, Satan, who rules this world. And uh, these are children of God who fight sin, strive to do that which is pleasing to God. But the spirit is willing, as Jesus said, but the flesh is weak. So we end up still sinning from time to time. And that's where Harris, Charis, Harris, uh, uh, as it's pronounced, um, comes in. Romans 6.23, we've all sinned. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God offered to save us. We said yes, we accept. And by his grace through faith, we received eternal life and salvation. God sees the end from the beginning. God calls those things which are not as if they already are. So that's why, even though I don't, if you slit my throat, I'll die. But I won't die forever. I'll be resurrected and have eternal life. That's why I can say I have eternal life. Now, there's nothing you can do that will make you have more eternal life, longer eternal life, better eternal life, better salvation. That's a gift. You can't earn gifts. You can't pay for gifts. Now, I want to focus a little bit now in the next few minutes that true faith and accepting of Yeshua <clears throat> includes committing to obey, to obey God as well. Not just because you have to, but we really come to the point where we find, boy, that's the way of peace and joy, and that's the way I want to go. Truly believing in Yeshua means you believe he's your... You know, when Joshua met um, the angel of the Lord in Joshua 5, I think it is, and they were, this was just before they attacked Jericho, and he's standing there with a drawn sword. Joshua comes up to him, he says, are you for us or against us? Are you for us or for the enemy? And he says, I'm not for you or against you. I've come here as commander of the armies of the Lord of hosts. And then Joshua immediately fell on his face to the ground. And then the one who became Yeshua said, take off your sandals, Joshua. This is holy ground because I'm here. And Joshua did. He obeyed him as Lord and master. And whatever he was told to do, he did. And that's where we have to come to be. We're saved by grace, but we're also called to obedience, as you're going to see. Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. But this is also why I don't participate in pagan holidays or customs. This is why I try to uh, be a friend of people, but not of the world system. Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9. Though he was a son, referring to Yeshua, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. The context of that, the, the verses two or three before that, talk about he cried out with vehement tears and loud cries in the garden when he was just saying, please, is there some other way? Is there, do I have to drink this cup? But not my will. And he was answered, he goes on to say, and he learned to be obedient even though the answer was apparently, son, we talked about this. 
you have to be crucified. I'll be with you through, through it to a point. At some point, it seems like God had to turn his back because of all the sins. And the whole land became dark for three hours. That was no eclipse. Eclipses last just minutes. And having been perfected, verse 9, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, some people can't seem to put this verse with the verse that say you've been saved by grace, not of works. When we are saved by God, we want to obey him. It's not what saves us. We're saved by his grace. But the more obedient we are, the higher our rewards will be. But he gives eternal salvation to those who obey him. If you say you claim Christ as your Savior and then totally do everything against him, you work on the Sabbath, you watch things you shouldn't watch on TV and computers, you go places you shouldn't go, you lose your temper, you gossip, you lie, you steal, you don't honor your father and mother, you use profanity, that's not being obedient. So obeying God is proof you've truly surrendered to him. And when he says jump, we start getting ready to jump and just say how high. So what we really believe is what we do. You can tell what a person believes by what they do. Abraham believed God. So it was accounted to him for righteousness. In the book of James it says he proved his faith by obeying by doing the things God told him to do, sacrifice your son. So our faith and belief come together. Faith, belief is another word for obedience. Look at the Hebrews 3, verses 18 to 19. If you read all of uh, Hebrews 3 before this point, you will see that um, Paul is saying that a lot of the Israelites, all the Israelites over age 20 except Joshua and Caleb, uh, could not enter the promised land because of their disbelief. They didn't believe God, which showed in the fact that they wouldn't obey him. Hebrews 13, 18 to 19. And to those, um, and to whom did he, God, swear they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey, obey. Okay, now verse 19. So we see they couldn't enter in because of unbelief. So belief in Christ has to be linked with obedience. That's the Bible teaching all the way through. We obey him, we submit to him. And if you want to have more verses on obedience, I'll post a bunch up here. I'll put them in the notes. That we, we do have to obey. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. That's one thing, for, for example. The obedient life now is we're following Yeshua's lead. He's actually the one working in us. He's actually the one living in us. And we just say, yes, sir, and follow him. Our disconnect comes, I think, when we realize that though we want to obey, we so often still fail. And that's where we feel like such failures, not just in keeping the commandments and obedience to God, but also we don't do our own goals. We don't get up when we want to get up, go to bed when we want to get up. We don't exercise as much as we want. We don't do the things to lose the weight we want to get in shape or, or, to, or to be a good father and mother. We, we, so every day we look at ourselves and say, I, I, I'm not measuring up. And so we start to feel bad. We start to feel bad that we're not going to be there somehow. And I want to talk about that again some more because I think this is so so ingrained, not just in the Sabbath-keeping Church of God people, but it's so ingrained in all religions. It's so ingrained in all those who, who are Christians, who call themselves Christians. They feel the same way. They don't feel they're measuring up. Now, what about our sins? Is it true God can really forgive everything we've done that was bad and continue to do so from time to time? Uh, whatever your life, whatever your sins have been, God's grace is way more powerful than any sin we can throw at him. If you're listening to this in a prison cell and you have murdered somebody, that's very bad. Or raped somebody, very bad. Or, or child molesting, or raping, murder, stealing, lying, arson, terrorism, all very bad. But God forgives that if you repent of it. Turn it over to Yeshua. 
How about sins that we don't consider as bad, but still require the death penalty, like coveting? That's a terrible, awful sin, like pride, like self-righteousness. You don't feel all that bad. You're kind of like Job, but you, don't, you weren't doing anything bad. It's just You hadn't acknowledged God's righteousness yet. So Job, all the way through, he even said at one point that his righteousness was greater than God's. He claimed that, apparently. And at the end of it, even though God himself said he was blameless, at the end of the book of Job and Job 42 and all that, he comes to realize, I abhor myself. I can't stand myself. I am vile, he says in another verse, towards the end of the book of Job. I am vile. I think that might be in Job 40. And I can't stand myself. And I repent. And why did he come to that? Because there's a verse that says right next to all those, I used to hear about you, but now I see you. Now I get it. You are what holiness is about. You are what perfection is about. And therefore, in your presence, I'm nothing. Yet before that, he'd been bragging about how he had done this and done that and everything else. So no matter what your sins have been, if you believe in Yeshua, Jesus Christ, with all your heart and being and accept God the Father's rule and love over you, Romans 5, 20, 21 says we can't out God's ability to cover it with his grace. The law entered that offense might abound. He's saying that by having the law there, we were more, more aware of all the sin but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign and so on. Grace abounded, superabounded, as one translation says. Now, grace, God's favor, God's pardoning, God's accepting of us is so powerful, is such a central part of becoming part of the kingdom of God and having Yeshua as your king that Paul even calls it in Acts 20, verse 24, the gospel of the grace of God. Write down in your notes, when, you, when, when was the last time that your fellowship, your church, used that phrase, the gospel of the grace of God? They might talk about grace, but do they teach it as part of the gospel? It really is part of it. Now, I want to, I want to go back and, and review some quick things. We showed in Romans 8, verses 1 to 4, that God is transforming us by putting over us and on us the life of Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, verse 2, 3, and 4, it says that God sent his Son in the likeness of flesh, and he performed perfectly all the requirements of the law, that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who have faith in him. We are walking according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. That His righteousness might be fulfilled in us. His righteousness. So as a friend put it, she said, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us His Son as the sacrifice for His sins. For our sins, I mean. As a sacrifice for our sins. And Romans, as Romans 8 to 4 so clearly says, that therefore the requirements of God's law would be fully satisfied for us who now follow the Spirit and not the carnal nature. Christ paid for your debt. He paid for your, the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. He fulfilled the law perfectly, and then he clothed us with himself. I've given many sermons on, on that. You might want to hear the sermon on God's perfection for us. This is so important to understand. I have sermons on God's righteousness, or, you, or do you want your own righteousness? If you just look up the word righteousness, you'll see I have sermons on righteousness. So Yeshua comes to live inside of us. It's now his life. We have crucified the self. We have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, Galatians 2.20. I no longer live. The life I live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ, or faith of Christ. And I love this here too. Now with him living in us by his Holy Spirit, any good things you're doing is actually his work. So it's actually not even your works. You're not saved by your works. But you can let Christ work in you and follow him. 
Paul said Christ worked mightily in him. Let's read it. Colossians 1, 28, the last part of 28 and 29. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. That we may present every man in Christ perfect, in, perfect in Christ Jesus. And to this end I also labor, striving. He says, I work hard. But I thought grace was free. But when you understand what God is doing, you want to be as bring him as much joy as possible. You want to do as much of his way as possible. And he says, oh, so I labor, I work at it, striving according to his working. You get that? He says, my striving is to let, let myself get out of the way and let him clean me up, let him work in me. That's what he's saying. Striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. I'm telling you, if, we, if you and I would do what Yeshua said, abide in me and I abide in you, he who abides in the vine shall bear much fruit in John 15, verse 4, 5, 6. Shall bear much fruit without me, you can do nothing. So if we seek him more and, and cut out time on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram and too much news and stuff like that, spend much more time in the Bible and prayer and going for a walk talking with God. Do that much more. Ask him to come and live mightily in you like he did Paul. Yes, we have to fight sin. Yes, we have to resist sin. Yes, we must repent when we sin. But a lot has changed now for you and me who have God's spirit. We still have the old man nature. But that old man, remember, was crucified with Christ. But the old man's nature seems to still be in there, right? The flesh. The Bible calls it the flesh. But that's not what God sees. In your own time, go back and reread Romans 8, verse 8 and 9. For those who live according to the flesh shall die. And then verse 9, Romans 8, 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if you have God's Spirit. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. I am flesh and blood, but God sees me as Spirit. He sees my old fleshly nature as dead. So please understand that. So that's why when we fight sins that so easily beset us and so many times we don't quite beat it, we ourselves will never totally conquer it, even with God's Spirit. There's still this tremendous joy we ought to have when we understand what God is doing in our lives. So let's look, go over some of those things again. <clears throat> some of you have a really hard time accepting some of these things. In my spirit, I feel some of you are going to have a hard time with some of this, but... Our death penalty, your death penalty, was paid for all time, one time, by Yeshua, for all time. He doesn't have to die again for you. It's already done. Christ dies only once for sinners. That's all through the book of Hebrews. I'll quote it later on. We don't have to fear the death penalty again. Uh, once we're going to be in the first resurrection, which is guaranteed by the Spirit, it says in Revelation 20, verse 6, that those in the first resurrection never have to worry or fear the second death. You're not going to die again, even though you still sin from time to time. It's settled and it's done. We'll read some more verses shortly. So we receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit begetting us into his family. It's actually an anointing of God's Holy Spirit. An anointing. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21. As long as we stay the course... God won't take that Holy Spirit away, even all the, even after the year or two or so after David sinned, killing Uriah. Uh, he still prayed, take not your spirit from me, because God hadn't taken it away yet. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, it says it's the guarantee of our salvation, God's Spirit. So God's also committed to finishing what he started in you, finishing it. For some of us, that could include fiery trials, martyrdom maybe, even beheading or whatever, if that's what it takes to get you repenting and back on the right track if you get off track. I believe there is a promise of safety, a place of safety, for those who are God's children and who are zealously praying and, and, and seeking him, not Laodicean types. So I'm not teaching a Jude 4 licentiousness. Okay, please understand that. 
we get the beginning of God's seed, his spirit, as I showed in part one. But God is not into spiritual abortion. He's not going to get you begotten into his body and then abort you. Okay? No one, once they're in his hands, will be able to be pried out of his hands. It says in John 10, I read those last time. No one means even you, brethren. Even you can't be pried of his hand, out of his hands unless you yourself permanently decide, knowing full well what you're doing, to walk away from him knowing full well. Then you've rejected the working of the Holy Spirit. and The guarantee is now null and void. Don't do that. But if you stumble in sin and repent, you're fine. You'll be fine. But if you remain practicing a lifestyle of sin as your way of life, I give a whole host of scriptures. Let's put them up. 1 Corinthians 9, Romans 8, Ephesians 5, Galatians 5. If you continue in a way of life that practices that, you will not have eternal life. You haven't really believed in the Son because those who believe in the Son will obey Him. Belief and obedience. Remember, we just read the verse. For they weren't allowed into the promised land because of their unbelief, because they wouldn't obey I just read that earlier in Hebrews chapter 3. Now, <clears throat> I think what gets a lot of the joy out of a lot of us is we look at our lives and we know we still stumble too often. Well, get back to God and get back to Christ. Quit watching junk on TV, movies that depict sinners sinning. Stop. Quit feeding the carnal fleshly nature. If you have lust, quit feeding that with the wrong types of depictions on TV or your computer. You will still stumble. Those who stumble, I believe, like whether it's eating too much or losing your temper or looking at things you shouldn't, drinking too much, gossiping, feelings of, yeah, I'm, I'm better than this person, feeling superior to other people, your self-righteousness, your pride, Maybe you flirt with other people's husbands or wives. You've got to stop it. But then you repent, and those who overcome all that, or much of, most of that or all of that, will definitely have a higher reward. Those who don't overcome much will still be saved, but as through fire. So I'm going to read here in a minute. It comes down to faith in Yeshua, that you do have eternal life. 1 Corinthians 5, we, talk, we talked a little bit last time. We'll look at it again. The, the, the sex sinner, brother. When Paul said, kick him out of the church, we can't have that open, open sin going on like that. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, this is a guy who was really sinning badly and so far hadn't repented. For the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. God had begun a work in him. God was going to finish a work in him. Now, how we build on our calling Paul says, I have laid the foundation which is Christ, and no other foundation can be laid. Now you're building on that foundation. Be careful what you build with. And he says, some of you are building with gold, silver, and precious stones. Some of you are building with wood, hay, and stubble. 1 Corinthians 3. Let's pick it up here now in verse 14 and 15. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Work, reward. See? In other words, the ones that will endure are the gold, silver, and precious stones. But if anyone's work is burned, because he was building in his spiritual life wood, hay, and stubble, he will suffer loss. <clears throat> but he, he lost what? He'll, he'll lose his reward. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. You see what I'm saying here? So when God commits to giving you salvation, he's going to fulfill it. 
some of us will go through that fire. Maybe all of us will go through a certain amount of fire. Some will go through a lot of it. And we'll still be saved. But not much of a reward. Salvation is not the reward. It's God's gift. Okay? Other points I want to remind you of. Our Father does not turn his love on or off. Many of us, maybe we were the kinds of fathers who showed love to our children if they always did the right thing. When they did the wrong thing, boy, did you unleash your anger on them and let them know. Might have even said, how can I love someone as bad as you? Okay, I hope not. But many of us were raised by a father who showed conditional love. And now you have been told you have a heavenly father who isn't like that. And it might be hard for many of you to accept that God the Father as a father could love you even when you're bad. Even when you're bad. God loved us and sent Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners, while we're bad. Romans 5 verses 6 to 9. Go back and read those verses if you want. Now, this applies to you Muslims, Hindus, Jews, Buddhists, Christians. If you want to come to Yeshua, if you want to come to true Christianity, accept the fact that whatever you've been and done, God can still love you. Some of you have sold your daughter into slavery. God can still love you. That's a horrible thing to do. God would not do that. God will forgive you. The story of the prodigal son, that guy had done just about everything wrong and terrible and bad. He couldn't believe that he could be accepted back as a son. He said, I'll go back as a hired hand, as one of your servants. The father, seeing him afar off, was so happy. Afar off, went running to his son, celebrated. Hey, put a new garment, the robe of righteousness on him. Put the ring of authority on his ring on his hands and put sandals of sonship on his feet. He's not a servant. So when we get off the bat, the path of God, God will in fact send his shepherd son to come look for us, the lost sheep, and celebrate. So when we still sin and stumble, it's not as a way of life. God still accepts you. God still loves you. You don't have to die the death penalty. That's already been paid. Uh, that, that's already been satisfied. You don't have to go through double jeopardy. Because the old you died. You were crucified with Christ. And, and look, Ephesians 1, verses 5 to 6. The Son of God now lives in us having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his pleasure, pleasure, you, me. He's bringing us into his family, the purpose of grace. That's one thing I didn't mention last time, the purpose of grace. According to his good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted, no matter what you've done or been, by which his grace has made us accepted. How? In the beloved, in Jesus Christ, in Yeshua. Now, having said that, we do now have to follow him, let him rule our life, let him change our life, let him clean out our life. 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, let's put it up there. You can say you know him, but if you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. It says in 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4. By this we know that we know him, we keep his commandments. Verse 5, whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. Verse 6, he who abides in him, in God, okay, in Christ, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now let's ask him to walk his life again in us. I pray that prayer a lot. I'm not as obedient as I need to be, dear Father. Yeshua, listen, please. I want you, please. 
walking out your life and my life again. Change me. Clean me. Make me like you. Help me grow in your image. I'm focusing on you. I don't want to focus on me. I think that's part of the problem, by the way. It's just coming to me, <laughs> not in my notes. We focus on overcoming this or overcoming that. And, and, and that's good to a point. And we focus on us rather than asking Yeshua. I focus on you, my master, to come and take the pride out of me. Gently, please. Give me patience, carefully, patience, pay, not all at once. Don't give me so many trials, though. Please be nice. And I pray that prayer, Jesus, come and live in me. I want you to walk out your life in me. Let me follow you. Goad me. Stimulate me with your thoughts that, hey, I'm getting off track or whatever. So even when we go astray, the shepherd comes looking for us. Our focus has to be on him. Okay, and if we do focus on him, we'll bear much fruit. Look what it says here in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. This is a passage my wife calls one of her favorites. It's one of mine too. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. It backs up exactly what I've just said. Focusing on him, not on me. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face like Moses unveiled his face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Now this is where you have to believe and have faith that God and Jesus mean what they mean, that if we will focus on Yeshua, talk to God the Father, walk with Yeshua, meditate on his word, have a morning devotional, have time with him on, in his word, get out there and go for a walk, while, you know, hear the birds singing and glorify him, focus on him, talk to him, invite him to lead your life. You are going to be transformed into the same image. Your guilt is gone. Don't keep going back to that. Don't look back. Yeshua looked on you when you repented and he saw no sin. Because all your sins have been poured on to Yeshua's son. He looked at his son and he saw all the sins of the world and he had to say, son, you die. You're guilty. But because he took my and your sins, I'm not guilty. You're not guilty. We still have the flesh. But God no longer sees us as being in the flesh. There is a judgment coming as to what our reward will be, but the judgment for eternal life is already done. That's what a lot of you will not accept. I know you. I was there. The judgment for eternal life has been done. We'll read that shortly. We passed from death to to life. Pass from it. We've been judged as sinless now through Christ. No double jeopardy. Our sin, our failings tomorrow will not change the deep love Father feels for us, even if your earthly father was like that with you or if you are that way with your children. And stop it if you're that way with your children or grandchildren. Love them. Discipline, yes. Correct, yes. Teach, yes but always, always in love. Discard any notions you have that God has conditional love. He doesn't. Now as God's children, when we repent to be brought close again, because we'd wandered off the path, we don't have to fear the second death anymore. Some of you are really struggling with this. Do you believe Yeshua's words or not? John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears the word and lives in him who has sent me and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment as far as judgment for eternal life goes. And we'll be judged for our, our rewards and our, our works. But as far as salvation goes, that judgment's done and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death 
into life. Do you believe him or not? Should that not give you tremendous joy? Where is it then? Why do I still talk to people who don't have that joy of salvation? Sometimes I fall into that too. King David had done a horrendous series of sins regarding Uriah and Bathsheba and killed Uriah uh, to cover up the pregnant, the wife he had made pregnant that he had committed adultery with. He had to go through many, many consequences of those sins. Yes, he did. God forgave him the spiritual consequence. You will not surely die. But he had other physical consequences that he had to go through. But what's interesting to me is when you read Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, my iniquity, and all that. My, my sins are ever before me. You see, and wash me, they'll be whiter than snow. All the things he says, and he's really torn up in the beginning of Psalm 51. As you get towards the end of Psalm 51, his prayer of repentance, he says, he says um, uh, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then he goes on from there to say, I'll, And I will help convert sinners to righteousness, sinners to your way. And now there's a very uplifting ending to it. Within one prayer, Paul understood there's no point in hanging on to something God's willing to cut off. Sin. And I can get back to having joy of salvation even though his son died seven days later. It's okay. That's one of the consequences. When you really thank God in and for all things, it's one of my favorite sermons I've given, thanking God in all things and for all things. No matter what happens to you, you thank God in it, for it. No matter what. Because he hasn't quit looking at you. He knows what's going on. He's allowed whatever to happen. Maybe even sent some things to happen. Thank him. You'll have tremendous peace. Some of you are fighting that. But it seems many of you coming to Christ have no joy of salvation because you don't believe everything I've just said. The seventh day keepers of the Church of God group, they feel sometimes like they have to make it. I wonder if I'll ever make it into the kingdom. I wonder if I'll ever make it to God's family. Thus they deny their faith in Yeshua who has made it for you. Romans 8, go back and read verses 1 to 4. Then read it and read it and read it again. Read it in all the various translations. Read it in the Greek. Read it, read it and read it. He fulfilled the requirements for us and gives us those. Romans 5 verse 17, he's given us the gift of of his righteousness. It's a gift we don't, ever, we don't ever talk about in what I call the cogs, the Church of God groups. Your best is not going to make it. Yeshua's best will already has. So stop feeling guilty all the time. The cogs are great, great, great at Olympic level guilt people. <laughs> You're not your own Savior. You have a Savior. He saved you. Accept it. You pass from death to life. We just read it in John 5, 54. Stick it up there again. John 5, 24. You have everlasting life. You shall not come into judgment. You pass from death to life. Now, having said that, neither do we want to be lax, Laodicean, licentious. No, we want to be zealous, on fire for God, striving against sin, with all our might, but as we stumble in it, as we shall. The sin that so easily besets us. Why did the writer of Hebrews just say the sin that we all, we've all conquered? No, he fought it too. I fight it. Stop refusing the joy of this salvation. Accept it. Having been saved by grace, for you have been saved by grace. I know there are some verses that talk about being saved and shall be saved. But God sees the end from the beginning. And as far as he sees you now, you are already saved. You are already in the kingdom. You are already, Ephesians 1 and 2 talk about sitting. I think it's Ephesians 2 in the first few verses. That you are sitting on the right hand of God's throne in Christ, through Christ. You understand what I'm saying? 
Quit trying to work it all out yourself. You're in Christ. He's the one God is looking at, and we're part of his body. So that doesn't just apply to Church of God people. Protestants, Catholics, 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 stop it. You don't have to do penance, indulgences and all that. You don't have to do so many laps around the rosary. You don't. Come to the true religion. Come to what the Bible really says. Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. You can know that you'll be in paradise, your, the true paradise. You can know that you have salvation. You can know you have a Father in heaven who is God, the one living God, who loves you. And he's not going to make you go through reincarnations, maybe as a cow one time. And if you've been really bad, maybe you come back as a bug. No, you don't. Hindus, stop it. That's not true. Muslims, you can be certain you'll be in paradise. You don't have to wait to know what Allah, your Allah, is thinking about you because do my good things outweigh my bad things? How do you know? Where's the standard ever put in the Quran? Where is it? You can know with God's word, the true, the true word of God. You claim to be part of Abraham? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I know that'll take some humbling. God wants you and his family, Muslims. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to go on some deadly, what do they call it, the uh, holy war. You don't have to go on a holy war and blast away the lives of a bunch of people. And that good thing somehow will then allow you to do whatever evils you want, outweighs all the, uh, all the, all the evils. That's why, you know, when they, when they ran those airplanes into 9-11, uh, that's why so many of them. I remember a guy named Atta. Just before all that, he was in a strip bar looking at naked men, looking at naked women, getting drunk and doing all kinds of wrong things. But it's okay because he had this special calling to kill a lot of people who were the enemies of Allah. And that would make, no matter what he did bad, all be washed away. That's a strange doctrine. Please, learn God's truth. You can know that you have been saved and will be in the kingdom of God if you accept Yeshua as your Savior. You don't have to earn it. 1 John 5, 11 to 13. And this is the testimony that God has given us, given, past tense, eternal life, and this life is in His Son. You've got to accept Yeshua. Jews, Judaism. He came to you. He was a Jew as a man. Open your eyes. Your Mashiach, your Messiah has come and is coming back to rule. You thought the Messiah would come to rule the first time. He came to be Savior the first time. I ask all of you Jews to read Isaiah 53 and the end of Isaiah 52 and Psalm 22. Those are all descriptions of what your Messiah did. And that's not being read in your, in your um, synagogues. It's not being read, ever. You take out your Tanakh, your scriptures, and turn to Isaiah 53 and read them. Read about your Savior, the suffering servant, who, the way he came the first time. He died for you. He loves you. I mean, even the one who betrayed him was named Judah. Yehuda. Okay, we, call, we say Judas, the Hellenized form of Judah. Okay, 1 John 5, 11 to 13. This is the testimony God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. Do you believe that? I do. I absolutely do believe I have life. He who does not. have the Son of God, does not have life. Verse 13, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. Do you? Do you know? John's saying to all of us, wake up. 
Quit feeling so guilty and downhearted and failing like you're failing all the time. Yes, strive to obey. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Are you there? That you may know you have eternal life? That's what this message is really all about. There's so many scriptures that tell us because of believing in Jesus, we have passed from death to life. If you don't believe in him, you're still in, 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 on the wrath side of God. He's very angry when we sin. And don't believe in his son. Don't accept the gift that he's giving you. Now, let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about this now. When you receive something from God, he expects us to share it. He wants you to share it. So if you're given a lot of money, he expects you to share it with others. It says that in Ephesians, I think, or Colossians, one of those. Find work so you have something to share with other people. Now, if you're in the body of Christ, you have his spirit, you put you in the body of Christ. You now belong to God when you have the Holy Spirit. Guess what? Everybody who has the Holy Spirit, and they probably aren't all just part of your congregation or fellowship. I'm going to give a sermon sometime soon. Who will be in the first resurrection? I might surprise you. Not everyone in the first resurrection, as some of you believe, will be the bride. Some will be guests. Some will be helpers and assistants and so forth. Bridesmaids. There's going to be one bride, one group of people, as one body, one bride, one bridegroom, and a lot of guests. We'll talk more about that later. My point, though, is when someone's been given the Holy Spirit, don't look down on them at all. Please don't. They belong to God as well. They belong to Christ as well. Romans 12.5. We've got to start thinking of ourselves as belonging to each other. So we being many are one body in Christ. The guy you try not to sit next to in church. If he has God's spirit and you have God's spirit, you're both in the body of Christ. But if you won't sit next to him or you don't want to visit him in his home because you heard he did some bad things 30, 40 years ago, or 30 days ago. Who's the one at fault? Now. So we being, money, being many are one body in Christ and individually we're members of one another. Members of one another. So Paul goes on in Romans to say in Romans 14, you might want to read the first 10 verses of Romans 14, quit judging the brethren. Quit judging them. I've done that. I've judged people. I'm sure you have. Quit it, Paul says. Because God is able to make that person you are judging stand. And he'll be angry at you and not the other person you're, you're judging. Romans 14.10 says something like that. And we'll be judged by the same standard we imposed on them. Remember, Jesus said that. God wants us esteeming one another. Philippians 2 verse 3, I think. God wants us esteeming one another better than ourselves. So those of you who won't visit with someone because you heard it, some, he's this way or that way or had been this way or that way, stop it. Stop it. Practice Philippians 2.3 instead. Esteem others better than yourselves. Whatever God does in us and for us, he wants us sharing with other people. When we exhibit his graces, his graciousness, I think he'll send us more. When we use it, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Colossians 4, verse 6, English Standard Version. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Always be gracious. Those of you who get on Facebook and write the most horrible things about a former president or present president that you don't like, and so you say horrible things, stop it. There's another verse that says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. And we're supposed to honor, in fact, the king. 
We're supposed to respect those who are over us and pray for them. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each person. 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift, use it. Use it. It's in Ephesians 4, isn't it, that it says each one has a part to play until we all come to the fullness, the stature of Christ. We all have a part. And God has put in apostles and pastors and teachers for the work of, and for, and so the brethren can have a work of ministry, of serving, of serving. They have a part to play. Use the talents, the gifts God's giving you to serve one another, it says, 1 Peter 4.10, as good stewards of God's varied grace. So if you see a brother in need, but you shut up your heart and don't help him, he says, how can you say you love God if you don't love your brother? Now, we are supporting groups of people or individuals here in America and Kenya and others so that they don't die, frankly. We have children who have AIDS because mom and dad got it from dad who gave it to mom who then got pregnant and had a baby who got AIDS. They'd be dead by now if they weren't being supported. So would others. So be willing to reach out. We have a, an orphanage there called Cup of Water Orphanage. You probably know some connection to the phrase cup of water, right? If you give a cup of water to, the little of the, the, to these little ones in my name, you'll have a reward. Now, how about God's grace, his favor, his pardon, his acceptance of you? Well, now, when you look at other people, you've got to forgive your brother of any sins that you feel he has or anything you feel he owes you. That's what the whole story of the last half of Matthew 18 is all about that this man had a certain servant who owed a lot of money and the ruler of the house forgave him, all of it. Then that guy went to someone else, one of the other servants, who owed him a little bit of money and threw him in jail because he couldn't pay it. The ruler heard about it and was furious. Matthew 18, 32, 35, my point is, if we don't forgive each other, accept one another, love one another, extend the hand of fellowship even to previous sinners, as we all have been sinners, but some are just worse sinners than you, and so you're not esteeming them better than you. You certainly never would do that. But you'd rather gossip about them instead. That's all got to stop. Matthew 18, verses 32 to 35, Then this master, after he'd called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry, delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father will also do to each of you, from who each of you from his heart, who, who from his heart does not, from his heart, really meaning it, does not forgive his brother is trespasses. We have got to not just take the grace of God and take it upon ourselves, but we have to be willing to pass it on to other people. Remember one time I'd given a sermon about God's mercy, God's tenderness, and my daughter, my oldest daughter, was making too much noise and I signaled at her during the sermon, stop it, kind of a thing, she didn't. So after services, when we got home, I said, you're going to have to get some discipline. Because when I look at you that certain way, give you a little wink or whatever, or touch my left ear or whatever, that's your signal when I see you're looking at me that you're going too far, cut it down, sh shut it down, be quiet, respect other people around you. You didn't do that this time. So I'm going to have to put some discipline here. Well, she looked down, started to cry, and she said, Dad, Dad, can you show me mercy and love? like God? What do you think I did? Because I realized how much mercy God has shown me. Okay? I have another story, but I'm running out of time. But anyway, people should be learning more about God, His love, His grace, and be willing to believe that God has truly, get this, 
that God has truly forgiven them because the brothers and sisters in the body of Christ who know about this guy's sins and past and things he's struggling with have accepted him and love him and have forgiven him because he sees the love of God in his brothers and sisters. He's able to believe that it really is from God and God has that feeling for them too. Remember the guy in 1 Corinthians 5, the sex sinner, thrown out of the fellowship. Sometime later, whether months or year later, I don't know, Paul tells the Corinthians, yes, even that guy, you've got to bring him back. He has changed. He has repented. And we like to try to decipher if a person's repented or not. But anyway, Paul says, if anyone's caused grief, 2 Corinthians 5, I mean 2 verses 5 to 9, uh, don't be too severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority sufficient. So that verse 7, on the contrary, you ought rather now to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one is swallowed up with too much sorrow because you won't let him back in to your fellowship. Verse 8, therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. There are people who can't go to anywhere. Anyway, reaffirm your love to him. Then jump to verse 11, lest Satan take advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. And remember also that in this same chapter, or same book, 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 17, when Paul talks about us being the new creation, he says a couple of verses before that, we've all known each other the way we used to be before God got involved in us, but now you're a new creation. Start seeing people differently. Let them change. Let them change. Do you get it? So quit gossiping about them. <laughs> we will easily, gladly gossip about somebody. My voice changed. I must be coming into puberty. Anyway, um, and yet we won't accept pers a person like that. I'll say again, it, takes, it, it makes it so much easier for people who've had a rough life in terms of obedience all their life to feel forgiven if they'll see the forgiveness coming from you, the brother or sister, okay? Uh, guys, don't be like the prodigal son. Don't be a prodigal son. I, I'm The brother, I mean. Don't be like the brother is what I mean to say. Don't be like the older brother of the prodigal son. Just don't. Don't be like that. So I hope this sermon's given you a lot of food for thought. I'm going to quickly run down real quickly. We'll put them up there, bang, 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 as I, as I speak. Um, the Sermon on Grace, that it's available to all God is calling because he's forming a literal family by his grace, by letting Yeshua be the life, by letting him be the sacrifice and the new life in us and giving us eternal life, salvation. The reason for his grace Second one is uh, learn to live in the joy of, of God loving you and calling you, accepting you as his beloved child as much as Yeshua was. Yeshua says in John 17, Father, let these know that you love them as you love me. If you can't imagine God ever saying to you, this is my beloved daughter, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, you haven't grasped the sermon yet. God is accepting of you. God does love you. God loved us so much. He let his eternal companion word come as a human being and die for you and live for you, get resurrected for you. Keep focusing on him, the author and finisher of our faith. As we focus on Christ, we will become more and more in his image. Don't focus so much on yourself. Focus on him. What I just said is so important. Focus on him, not on you. I might write a blog to expand on that. Show loving acceptance of others who have done terribly wrong things but are now turning it around, want to be back in the body of Christ, be willing to wash their feet, be willing to let that person who God is calling out of jail to come be part of your fellowship. If he's repented and wants to be baptized and receive God's Spirit, we're saved freely by grace as God's gift. We're not going to be 
And we're rewarded by works. We're rewarded by our deeds, saved by God's deed, God's free gift. All our sins are for forever washed away, as far as God's concerned, or forgotten. Once we've repented and have God's Spirit, we are in Christ, accepted his death, and God makes some wonderful things now begin to happen. That means we now belong to him. That's the purpose of grace. And when we sin now, we're not condemned, ever. Once we have God's Spirit, once we're a child of God and we flub up and we do the wrong things, we're not condemned. Romans 8, 1, there's now no condemnation to those who, like me, have been sinning from time to time, is the context of Romans 8, 1, Paul's own listing that he still sinned from time to time. But who's going to deliver me from this body of this death, Rome, end of Romans 7? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. There's therefore now no condemnation. We never lose God's spirit now unless we ourselves walk away from God permanently, knowing what we're doing. God's Holy Spirit guarantees our salvation. He's not going to take the Holy Spirit away. God doesn't cut us off from him when we sin. I know. Isaiah 59, 2, I know the verse well. That your sins have separated you from, from me, that I will not hear you. That was said to an evil, wicked nation. When we become children of God and, and, and sin, when Abraham sinned and, and lied about Sarah, did God cut him off? Or did God, in fact, defend, in a way, Abraham and warn, uh, warn the, the king that he gave his wife to? Uh, be careful, don't touch that woman. She's someone else's man. So he, she was there for a while, apparently. So God doesn't cut us off from him when we sin now. Hebrews 13, 5, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Ever. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. These are things that Church of God people especially have a hard time accepting. This is what the Bible teaches, though. Christ's death covered and paid for all our sins for all time, not just the sins you did up to the point where you finally repented, got baptized, received the Holy Spirit. But then after that, well, that's another matter. No, no, Christ's death covered all of that one time for all time. The debt, the debt of, of death is paid one time. And yet his blood, 1 John 1, 7, is an ongoing tense in the Greek, even in the English translations. His blood continues to cleanse us. His blood cleanses us, ongoing tense, from all our sins that we still commit from time to time. 1 John 1, 7. So we've all passed from death to life and are seen as having eternal life. We've read that, John 5, 24. And Revelation 20, verse 6 says we don't have to fear, we don't have to fear the second death. Revelation 20, verse 6. So now that we should understand this, I hope we'll start feeling, ha, ah, Relief. I don't have to die. I pass from death to life. I have eternal life. He won't cut me off. I can come home like the prodigal son and he'll celebrate me even when I've gone astray. Know that because some of you will go astray, maybe for a time even. Know that you can come back. Hebrews 9, 27, 28. Let's end with this. As has been appointed to men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered up once, once. He's not to keep dying for all, every sin we commit from now on. Once, to bear the sins of many. He's the one bearing it. Azazel is not, Satan doesn't bear our sins. He was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. Eagerly. If you're scared to death of his judgment on you, you're not going to be eagerly awaiting it. Those who eagerly wait for him, he'll appear a second time apart from sin. Why? Because there's no sin now. It's been taken away. Even when you do sin, it's gone. Repent of it, bring it to God, it's gone. He cleanses us from all sin. Apart from sin for salvation. Holy Father, we come before you as our righteous Holy Father, and we just ask in Yeshua's mighty name that you will just fill us with your Holy Spirit and let us have this joy of your salvation to know that we have eternal life, to know we pass from death to life, to know that you're not ever going to cut us off. 
as long as we keep coming back to you in prayer and seeking you and loving you, you will always love us. Even your discipline is because you love us. Help us, Father, understand that. All who hear this sermon, I hope that they will learn to love you and rejoice in you and just enjoy you and obey you because, Father in heaven, we want to obey you because we love you. Help us love you more. Rain down your Holy Spirit. We pray for special protection against your against the COVID for all of your children all around the world. Father, a thousand might fall at one side, and but you're but not these people. Just, just Father, please watch out for them and, and for all the other horrible things. We have many brethren, Father, in Asia and other places who are being terribly persecuted because they, they have confessed Jesus Christ. Watch over them, guard them, protect them, bless them. Please give them a great reward for what they've faced. And for all of you hearing that over there, we are praying for you. Father in heaven, love them. Show them your love. Protect them. And if you deem it necessary that they be martyrs, then give them the courage to do it and glorify your name. But Father in heaven, we just ask you now to help us understand your tremendous grace and your favor. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>